Welcome to the Work Trends Podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan Mbiro. Every week I interview interesting people who are reimagining work. And be sure to check out our Work Trends Twitter chat events calendar located at talentculture.com on the podcast page. Welcome, everyone, to the Talent Culture Work Trends Podcast. In today's episode, we are talking about leading with values and resolving conflicts with a conscience. But first, a quick question. Was your first instinct to crack a joke about the oxymoron of business ethics? We could, and that's really easy. It's a rich comic strip tradition. But the fact that many people picture business values along the lines of the Wolf of Wall Street points to a much larger problem for corporate America, a reckoning about the right way to conduct business, and a new challenge for businesses to attract top talent. Once upon a time, you work for a paycheck with the promise of a gold watch in retirement. These days, get this, 83% of millennials want brands to align with them on values. 75% would take a pay cut to work for a socially responsible company, and 64% won't take a job if an employer doesn't have strong corporate responsibility practices. They're not the only ones. Consumers of today have unprecedented access to information and greater coordination thanks to social media. However, millennials have the highest expectations of corporate responsibility, and they will comprise 75% of the workforce by 2025. That's a problem for businesses because fewer than half of millennials believe that corporations behave ethically. Today's guest, G. Richard Shell, hears these concerns from his students all the time, and he's intent on solving them. Here's some background on Richard. Richard Schell is a global thought leader and senior faculty member at one of the world's leading business schools, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He serves as the chair of Wharton's Legal Studies and Business Ethics Department, the largest department of its kind in the world. His forthcoming book, The Conscience Code, Lead With Your Values, Advance Your Career, addresses an increasingly urgent problem in today's workplace, standing up for core values such as honesty, fairness, personal dignity, and justice when the pressure is on to look the other way. Richard is a skilled communicator across many diverse audiences. He has written for and or been featured in, all right, is everybody sitting down with their seatbelts on? The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Fast Company, Inc., Financial Times, U.S. News and World Report, Time, USA Today, Huffington Post, Real Simple, Bottom Line Personal, and Men's Health. His students have have included everyone from Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, Fortune 500 CEOs, to FBI hostage negotiators, Navy SEALs, and the United Nations peacekeepers. In addition, he has worked extensively with public school teachers, labor unions, nurses, hospital administrators to help them become more effective professionals. I know he's got a lot of knowledge to share with us today, so I'm going to get started and just dive right in. So welcome, Richard. Megan, really, really appreciate your having me. Thank you. That's a daunting introduction. Well, you know, you're kind of a big deal. What can we say? I've been at it a while. Yeah, definitely. And you are sitting in your air conditioning office today. Is that right? Yeah, home office. Yeah. So you are there in your home office today with the AC on. Yeah, it's pretty hot in Philadelphia these days. So uh, I'm grateful to have the electricity working. I tell you, you know, you write that courage has very little to do with whistleblowing against corrupt bosses and organizations. How can that be? Well, that's a great question to start with. I think courage is one of these, you know, Aristotle wrote a lot about virtue. And he defined courage as the midpoint between recklessness and timidity. If you think of recklessness and timidity, they're not really virtues, they're tendencies. <laughs> you know, you can be a timid person, you can be a reckless person. And I think courage as a word is actually something that we apply to someone after the fact when we admire what they did and we say, wow, you know, that little kid was courageous to jump into the pool, you know, when it was cold water. And what we're really saying is that, you know, that person was able to take a risk and that they had the confidence that they would make it through. And so I actually think the more apt word to define, especially when it comes to standing up for values, is self-confidence. 
you have the courage of your convictions, but you know, I think it's more this sort of purpose that you have than it is whatever this word courage means. Uh, when I very rarely, I've taught Navy SEALs, I've taught you know these FBI hostage negotiators. Very rarely, in fact, never has any one of them ever claimed courage as a virtue. They thought of it as doing their duty. They thought of it as getting through a tight situation. They thought of it as managing chaos. And then after it's all over, someone comes along and says, wow, the Navy SEALs are courageous, or that FBI hostage negotiator was courageous. And it's a kind of daunting thing to think, well, in order to stand up for your values, you have to be courageous. I don't think so. I think you really don't have to be courageous. I think you have to be settled on what your values are, and you need to have some beliefs about what's negotiable and what's not negotiable. And then you need to have some savvy about how you're going to advance the, the value and, and effectively uh, make changes. Because it could be that the smartest move is not a direct frontal attack, which would be what someone would say requires courage. It could be it's going to be some sort of coalition building and actually a kind of a development of a position so that by the time you actually confront the people that need to be confronted, you're in a large group, everybody's on the same page, and you feel that you're protected. Well, and let's remember something in real time, right? It's an action verb, and courage is the number one virtue for whistleblowers, isn't it? Well, it's the number one virtue people ascribe to whistleblowers. I'll give you an example. Tyler Schultz uh, was uh, one of the two whistleblowers in the Theranos case. Yeah, it's the medical device case run by Elizabeth Holmes, who is currently on about to start her trial for fraud along with her COO. And uh, Erica Chung and Tyler Schultz are both young people in their early 20s. And they're the ones who ended up helping bring to light all the practices that the firm was engaging in that brought the company to its demise. But after all this is over, and Tyler Schultz was sort of a famous person, he'd been on 60 Minutes, and he said he'd never even thought of the term whistleblower until he read about it and his name was associated with it. He just thought of what he was doing as being a person of conscience who was trying to do the right thing. And, you know, he had values. He, his grandfather was on the board. He's trying to protect his grandfather. It wasn't about whistleblowing for him. It was about just doing what looked like a common sense thing that a good person would do. Well, I tell you, your students are reporting a lot of pressure, I hear, to behave unethically in the corporate world these days. Is it worse now than it's been in the past? I think it is. And, you know, the, the reason I wrote the Conscience Code really comes out of a, a question one of my students asked. I, I teach a course on responsibility. It's a required course for the MBA students. And during the class, we share stories, uh, both success and, and less successful stories of moments when values have been challenged and, and how the students responded at one of their jobs uh, between college and, and their graduate school time. And this story, this one woman uh, was telling, told this story. She had been at a client dinner uh, celebrating the end of a contract. There were about you know eight people at a table. She was sitting next to the client who was like the head of marketing for the client firm. And she's sitting there and all of a sudden she feels this uh, hand on her leg. So she brushed it off and you know it was the client. And then uh, pop back on there again. So she got up on a pretext to, you know, go to the ladies room and felt maybe that would break the mood and went back and sat down again, pop hands back again. So she switched seats with somebody. So there was, there was no doubt in her mind, that, you know, that she was not going to like give into this, but she finished and, you know, she went after she switched seats, of course, you know, the episode was over. She went to her boss afterwards and next day and said, Hey, you know, this is what was going on at that dinner. You know, this, this guy's a creep. And the boss said, he shrugged. He said, well, you know, no harm done. Nobody's hurt. He's an important client. Move on. So she, in the class, she told the story and it was the reason that she left the firm and started applying to MBA programs. She just was very demoralized by that attitude. But she said, what should I have done? I felt powerless. What should I have done? And I thought to myself, great question. <laughs> what should you have done? And so the Conscience Code is sort of a guerrilla warfare um, manual for people who want that question answered. They're facing some situation, whether they're high in the company or low. And, you know, we've had 
whistleblowers who are CEOs of their own companies. They blow the whistle on the board. So this is not limited to people who are in junior positions, but it's really a a step-by-step guide for taking on conflicts over values and managing them to a successful outcome. And that doesn't mean you blow whistles. And it doesn't mean you go and confront people. It means you think about the situation you're in, the company you're in, the network you have, and you strategically advance to a solution. Because I'm really trying to help people stand and fight instead of cut and run. And a lot of my students had chosen to cut and run. So it's, it's uh, I'm an expert on negotiation. I'm just bringing all that to these sensitive value conflicts. Well, and what happens when we all cut and run? I mean, we're faced with a very terrible endpoint there, I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah, we've empowered the toxic bosses, we've empowered the toxic cultures, and that's not really what we ought to be doing. And I have to ask you, are some professions, say banking or finance, are they more prone to unethical behavior than others? Aren't Wharton School graduates responsible for a lot of bad behavior, frankly, in these sectors? Well, you know, I think MBA students become corporate leaders and corporate leaders are the ones who are responsible for the cultures at their firms and organizations. So I absolutely think that uh, they bear responsibility along with the Wharton School itself. The reason we teach this course is to sort of try to do our part to put the, the seed in place to refer them to their better selves and to show them how much influence they can have for good if they choose to exercise it and that it's their responsibility. That that responsibility course title is not an accident. I'm a believer that there's everybody except for the psychopaths. Now, the, you know, the research is about roughly 3% of people in business are psychopaths. And a psychopath, and I don't mean a serial killer. I mean, a psychopath is someone like Bernie Madoff. They're a person who has no conscience, no sense of right and wrong, other than just their ability to manipulate other people to gratify themselves and their own goals, uh, whether it's financial or ego or whatever. So we're not going to reach them. Oh, really? So you think it's a no, you think like that's, that's hopeless, basically. It's not hopeless. We we have to bring them down. I don't know whether Elizabeth Holmes satisfies the criteria for that psychological condition. It is a psychological condition. But when you have someone running a company who is running it solely for their own aggrandizement and they're manipulating everyone around them, the goal is to bring them down. It's not to work with them or to try to correct their course. But that's just 3%. The rest of the people, I think, rest of us, have good angels and lesser angels on our shoulders. We have good intentions and then we have pressures and temptations. And every day, in some way or another, we struggle to give the better angels the decision-making power to execute on their intentions. And we learn how to cope with the lesser angels that are still there. So I think even a a well-meaning person is going to be faced with these conflicts. And they're not a bad person if they're facing pressure from a boss who is going to threaten to fire them if they don't go along with something or help them engage in something. I think what we need to do is give them the tools so they can effectively recognize the situation they're in and help them save their souls so that they don't live a life of remorse about these moments, but they have some pride in how they handled it. But I do think it's more common now for this reason. I think that the social movements in the surrounding society have brought values to a much more salient place. A lot of this got swept under the rug. The fact that this woman put up with a client who was sexually assaulting her, essentially, at this dinner. I think 25 years ago or 30 years ago, it wouldn't have even hit the radar screen. You know, she would have considered it something she had to put up with to be a professional woman and probably wouldn't have even commented on it in class. So now we've got the Me Too movement. We've got uh, movements for social justice. We've got lots of people who've been sensitized to insults that uh, are very, very hurtful that normally in the past, people have just absorbed and internalized. And now we're like, wait a minute, you know, we don't have to put up with this. No, I mean, there's consequences, finally. And and it's about consequences. I mean, Harvey Weinstein is sitting in a jail and likely will be for the rest of his life. Uh, Well, we, we can hope. We can hope, at least. You know, you have something called the power of two, and this plays a crucial role in the values to action process. Can you explain what that means and give us a couple of examples of how it works? Sure. Thank you. I, the power of two, I think, is one of the is sort of the basic starter kit for effectiveness when you have a values conflict. And the values to action conflict process is where it fits in. So let me just 
pause there. I sort of outlined four steps that uh, when people are in the workplace, that'll help them. It's like a dance. They know where they are. They know what's happening next. You can gain some measure of control if you realize that it's a process. And the four steps are first, observe what's going on. So be, have the courage to see what's happening. It's actually is a sexual assault, you know, and you need to recognize it and label it. Second is own the problem. Make it your responsibility to do something about it. And those are both internal. That's just with you. You recognize it. Your perceptions are acute. You own it. Your sense of responsibility and duty are triggered. Then the next step is decide what to do. And my very strong recommendation, because this is something my students have taught me, the first thing you do is find somebody else to bring onto your team because it's the isolation and the feeling that you're all alone and the feeling that, you know, you're the only one that, you know, has this issue and, and you're powerless. That's where a lot of it stops and, and people just withdraw. And if you can engage with just one other person, now it could be another person at work that you're friends with, that you trust. It could be a, a trusted mentor at work, if you have a good mentor. Very often business units can go off the rails, but the mentorship system might still be working with some good people. So maybe that. It could be someone from outside the organization uh, where it's a, a, a classmate from college or a good friend or even a, a partner that you, you know, live with. But as soon as you start verbalizing it and sharing it, then the ownership gets lighter and you gain more perspective, you gain more self-confidence, you gain more thoughts and ideas about what to do. And that's when you start getting movement, you start getting ideas, you start getting options. And then you begin thinking through a strategic set of options. The, the example I use in the book and sort of go back to Erica Chung and Tyler Schultz at Theranos, because they were both 22 year olds, they joined the firm at the same time, they didn't know each other, but each one separately observed what they thought were very peculiar practices with data being falsified or or tests being run that actually weren't being run or regulatory data was being submitted that was wrong. And, and they just happened to meet each other. And, you know, they looked at each other over the lunch table and said, you know, this is what I'm seeing. Do you see anything like that? And the other one said, yeah, I'm seeing the same thing. And now all of a sudden, the power of two locked in and they could take strength from each other. And then they started having lunch together every day and mixing and matching what they were observing and gaining momentum and gathering evidence and actually documenting what they were seeing just because there were two of them. And each alone probably would have felt powerless. The two together made a great team. I mean, they ended up quitting because it was a corrupt organization. It wasn't just a corrupt part of the organization and they were outgunned. But even as they left the firm, they took evidence with them. They both filed regulatory reports. Uh, they were supporting each other. And I think that's what the power of two does. And the research, the social psychology on pressure from authority and peer pressure, the classic experiments all show that alone a subject in these experiments was very likely to yield to authority or cave in to peers. But as soon as there was one other person in the experiment that was a trusted partner and would speak the truth, the people who are the subjects of the experiment were incredibly empowered to speak the truth and to, and to push back. Even in these little experiments that had nothing much to do with that. Well, I guess the Milgram experiments had a lot to do with values. But in the end, the power of two is, you know, form an alliance. And then that alliance will exponentially increase your effectiveness. But then the two of you have social networks and you can bring a larger group along. And now we're talking about uh, Google employees walking out all over the world to protest someone getting a sexual predator, getting a big payout for his exit package and changing Google's sexual harassment policy because they formed a very, very effective coalition. Because two is then a multiplier. So if you're out there and you're in a culture that feels toxic, just know there's a lot of sage here in these stories that, you know, two becomes four and four becomes six and so on. So, you know, I have to tell you, I'm having a lot of fun in this discussion and learning so much from you, but we have reached the time where we have to each pull out our crystal balls. So let's do that. Let's start thinking about what's next. I want to hear from you. What are your predictions for the future of work? Well, I think these values that I'm writing about are going to play a bigger role. I kind of look at the future of work as a set of people, whatever level they happen to be on, and everybody has a backpack. And in the backpack, they have uh, their experience, 
uh, their skills, their credentials, and their mindset. And it's going to be a learning journey for most people. Work is not going to be a career. Work is going to be a learning journey. And the backpack is what you put in to your backpack after you've had some set of professional experiences and you ask yourself, well, what did I learn that I can take with me? And then you put that in the backpack and then you move on. Now, you could move on within an organization and move to different parts of it or greater responsibilities. But in a sense, those are actually different jobs. But more likely, we the research that we I've seen from the, the government, US government, is that on average now, people change their jobs around 12 times during the course of their adult life. And I think that number is going to go up. I think people are going to be jumping uh, from between jobs, between companies, and they're going to jump to the places they think can teach them the most. Well, I would like to say at the end of this podcast that if you're out there and you're wondering about talent retention, now is the time to start thinking about how can you give everybody a learning journey? I love that because it's so true. Unless we're on a journey somewhere, hint, hint, they're going elsewhere. And I think that is a very important takeaway, one of many today. So thank you so much, Richard, for stopping by and sharing your sage. Megan, it was a great pleasure to be with you. I really appreciate having the conversation. If you enjoy listening to the Work Trends podcast, do me a favor, share it with the world so they can stay current on what's happening in the world of work. And do me another favor, be sure to listen in to our next podcast when I'm going to be speaking with another very interesting Work Trends guest. Thanks for listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. Join us every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for a live Twitter chat with our podcast guest. To learn more about guests featured on today's show, visit the show notes for this episode at talentculture.com and help us spread the word. Subscribe to Work Trends wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating, review, and iTunes. Share Work Trends with your coworkers, your friends. Look forward to it. See you next time.